No End House by Brian Russell. Let me start off by saying that Peter Terry was addicted to heroin. We were friends in college and continued to be after I graduated. Notice that I said, I. He dropped out after two years of barely cutting it. After I moved out of the dorms into a smaller apartment, I didn't see Peter as much. We would talk online every now and then. AIM was king in the pre-Facebook years. But there was a period where he was not online for about five weeks straight. I wasn't worried. He was a pretty notorious flake and a drug addict. So I assumed that he just stopped caring. Then one night, I saw him log on. And before I could initiate the conversation, he sent me a message. David, man, we need to talk. That, that was when he told me about the No End House. It got its name because no one ever reached the final exit. The rules were pretty simple and cliche. Reach the final room of the building and you win $500. There were nine rooms in all. The house was located on the outside of the city, roughly four miles away from my house. Apparently, Peter had tried and failed. He was a heroin and a who-knows-what-the-fuck addict, so I figured the drugs got the best of him and he wigged out at a paper ghost or something. He told me it would be too much for anyone, that it was unnatural. I didn't believe him. I told him that I would go check it out the next night, and no matter how hard he tried to convince me otherwise, $500 sounded too good to be true. I had to go. I set out the following night. When I arrived, I immediately noticed something strange about the building. You ever see or read something that shouldn't be scary, but for some reason a chill crawls up your spine? I walked toward the building and that uneasy feeling only intensified as I opened the door. My heart slowed and I let out a sigh of relief as I entered. The room looked like a normal hotel lobby decorated for Halloween. The sign was posted in the place of a worker. It read, Room 1, this way. Eight more follow. Reach the end and you win. I chuckled and made my way to the first door. The first area was almost laughable. The decor reminded me of a Halloween aisle at Kmart complete with ghost sheets and animatronic zombies that gave a static glow when you walked by. At the far end, there was an exit. It was the only other door besides the one I entered through. I brushed through the fake spiders and headed towards the second room. I was greeted by fog as I opened up the door to room two. The room definitely upped the ante in terms of technology. There was not only a fog machine, but a bat hung from the ceiling and flew in a circle. Scary. There seemed to have been a Halloween soundtrack that you would find at a 99 cent store on a loop somewhere. I didn't see a stereo, but I guess they probably had a PA system. I stepped over a few toy rats that wheeled around and walked with a puffed chest through to the next area. I reached for the doorknob and my heart sank to my knees. I didn't want to open that door. A feeling of dread hit me so hard that I could barely think. Logic overtook me after a few terrified moments, and I shook it off and entered the next room. Room 3 is where things began to change. On the surface, it looked like a normal room. There was a chair in the middle of a wood-paneled floor, a single lamp in the corner doing a poor job of lighting the area, casting a few shadows across the floors and the walls. There was a problem. Shadows. Plural. With the exception of the chair, there were others. I had barely walked in the door, and I was already terrified. It was at that moment that I knew something wasn't right. I didn't even think as I automatically tried to open up the door I just came through. It was locked from the other side. That set me off. Someone was locking the doors as I progressed. There was no way. 
I would have heard him. Was it a mechanical lock that set automatically? Maybe. But I was too scared to really think. I turned back to the room and the shadows were gone. The chair shadow remained though, but the others were gone. I slowly began to walk. I used to hallucinate when I was a kid. So I wrote off shadows as a fragment of my imagination. I began to feel better as I made about the halfway point of the room. I looked down and took my steps, and that's when I saw it, or didn't see it. My shadow wasn't there. I didn't even have time to scream. I ran as fast as I could to the other door and flung myself through without thinking of the room beyond. The fourth room was probably the most disturbing. As I closed the door, all the light seemed to be sucked out and put back into the previous room. I stood there surrounded by darkness, not able to move. I'm not afraid of the dark and never have been, but I was absolutely terrified. All sight had left me. I held my hand in front of my face and I didn't even know what I was doing. I would have never been able to tell. Darkness doesn't describe it. I couldn't hear anything. It was dead silent. When you're in a soundproof room, you can still hear yourself breathing. You could hear yourself be alive, you know? I couldn't. I began to stumble forward for a few moments. My rapid heart beating was the only thing I could feel. There was no door in sight. I wasn't even sure there was one. The silence was then broken by a low hum. I felt something behind me. I spun around wildly, but I couldn't even see my own nose. I knew it was there, though. Regardless of how dark it was, I knew something was there. The hum grew louder, closer. It seemed to surround me, but I knew whatever was causing that noise was in front of me. Inching closer, I took a step back. I've never felt that kind of fear. I can't really describe it. I wasn't even scared I was going to die. I was scared of what the alternative was. I was afraid of whatever this thing had in store for me. But then the lights flashed for just a second, and I saw it. Nothing. I saw nothing, and I know I saw nothing. The room was again plunged into darkness, and the hum became a wild screech. I screamed in protest. I couldn't listen to this goddamn sound for another minute. I ran backwards, away from the noise, and fumbled with a door handle. I turned and fell into room 5. Now, before I describe room 5, you have to understand something. I am not a drug addict. I have no history of drug abuse or any sort of psychosis, short of the childhood hallucinations I mentioned earlier. And those were only when I was really tired or just waking up. I entered the no-end house with a completely clear head. After falling in from the previous room, my view of the room was from my back, looking up at the ceiling. What I saw didn't scare me, it simply surprised me. Trees had grown into the room and towered above my head. The ceiling in this room was taller than the other ones, which made me think that this was the center of the house. I got up off the floor and dusted myself off, took a look around. It was definitely the biggest room of all of them. I couldn't even see the door from where I was. Various brush and trees had blocked my line of sight to the exit. Up to this point, I figured the rooms were gonna get scarier, but this was paradise compared to the last room. I also assumed that whatever was in room 4 stayed back there. I was incredibly wrong. As I made my way deeper and deeper into the room, I began to hear what one would hear if they were in a forest. Chirping bugs, the occasional flap of a bird's wings, seemed to be the only company I had in this room. That was the thing that bothered me the most. I heard bugs and other animals, but... I didn't see any of them. I began to wonder how big this house was. 
From the outside, when I first walked up to it, it looked like just a regular house. It was definitely on the bigger side, but there was almost a full forest in here. The canopy even covered my view of the ceiling. But I assumed it was all still there, however high it was. I couldn't see any walls either. The only way I knew I was still inside was the floor. It matched the other rooms, the standard dark wood paneling. I kept walking, hoping that the next tree I pass would reveal a door. After a few moments of walking, I felt a mosquito fly on my arm. I shook it off and kept going. A second later, I felt about ten more land on my skin in different places. I felt them crawl up and down my arms and legs. A few made their way across my face. I flailed wildly to get them off, but they just kept crawling. I looked down and let out a muffled scream. More of a whimper. To be honest, I didn't see a single bug. Not one single bug was on me, but I could feel them crawl. I heard them fly by my face and felt them sting my skin, but I couldn't see a single one. I dropped to the ground and began to roll wildly. I was desperate. I hated bugs, especially ones I couldn't see or touch. But these bugs could touch me, and they were everywhere. I began to crawl. I had no idea where I was going. The entrance was nowhere in sight, and I still hadn't even seen the exit. So, I just crawled, my skin wriggling with the presence of these phantom bugs. After what seemed like hours, I finally found the door. I grabbed the nearest tree and propped myself up, aimlessly slapping my arms and legs to no avail. I tried to run, but I couldn't. My body was exhausted from the crawling and dealing with whatever it was on me. I took a few shaky steps towards the door, grabbing each tree on the way for support. It was only a few feet away when I heard it. The low hum from before. It was coming from the next room, and it was deeper. I could almost feel it inside my body. Like when you stand next to an amp at a concert. The feeling of the bugs on me lessened as the hum grew louder. I placed my hand on the doorknob. The bugs were completely gone, but I couldn't bring myself to turn the knob. I knew that if I were to let go, the bugs would return and there was no way I could make it back to room 4. I just stood there. My head pressed against the door Mark 6 and my hand shakily grasping the knob. The hum was so loud that I couldn't even hear myself think. There was nothing to do except move on. Room 6 was next. And room 6 was hell. I closed the door behind me, my eyes held shut and my ears ringing. The hum was surrounding me. As the door clicked into place, the humming was gone. I opened my eyes in surprise and the door I had just shut was gone too. It was just a wall now. I looked around in shock. The room was identical to three. Same chair, same lamp. But with the correct amount of shadows this time. The only real difference was there was no exit door and the one I came through was gone. As I said before, I have no previous issues of mental instability, but at that moment, I fell into what I now know was insanity. I didn't scream. I didn't make a sound. First, I scratched, softly. The wall was tough, but I knew there was a door there somewhere. I just knew it was. I scratched at where the doorknob was. Then, I clawed the wall frantically with both hands, my nails being filed down to the skin against the wood. I silently fell to my knees. The only sound in the room, the incessant scratching against the wall. I knew it was there. I knew the door was there. I knew it was just there. I knew if I could just get past the wall. Are you all right? I jumped off the ground and spun in one motion. I leaned against the wall behind me and I saw what it was that spoke to me. 
to this day, I regret ever turning around. There was a little girl. She was wearing a soft white dress down to her ankles. She had long blonde hair to the middle of her back, white skin and soft blue eyes. She was the most frightening thing I had ever seen. And I know that nothing in my life will ever be as unnerving as what I saw in her. While looking at her, I saw something else. Where she stood, I saw what looked like a man's body, only larger than normal and covered in hair. He was naked from head to toe, but his head was not human and his toes were hooves. It wasn't the devil, but at that moment, it might as well have been. The form had the head of a ram and the snout of a wolf. It was horrifying and it was synonymous with the little girl in front of me. They were the same form. I can't really describe it, but I saw them at the same time. They shared the same spot in the room, but it was like looking in two separate dimensions. When I saw the girl, I saw the other form. And when I saw the form, I saw the girl. I couldn't speak. I could barely even see. My mind was just revolting in an attempt to process what this is. I had been scared before in my life, but I've never been more scared than when I was trapped in the fourth room. But that was the room before six. I just stood there, staring at whatever it is that spoke to me. There was no exit. I was trapped in there with it. And then it spoke again. David, you should have listened. When it spoke, I heard the words of a little girl, but the other form spoke through my mind in a voice I won't attempt to describe. There was no other sound, just the voice kept repeating that sentence over and over and over in my mind, and I agreed. I didn't know what to do. I was slipping into madness, yet I couldn't take my eyes off of what was in front of me. I dropped to the floor. I thought I had passed out, but the room wouldn't let me. I just, I just wanted it to end. I was on my side and my eyes were wide open and the form was staring down at me. Scurrying across the floor in front of me was one battery powered rat from the second room. The house was toying with me, but for some reason, seeing that rat pulled me back from whatever depths I was headed and I looked around the room. I was gonna get out of there. I was determined to get out of that house and live and never think about this place again. I knew this room was hell and I wasn't ready to take up residency. At first, it was just my eyes that moved. I searched the walls for any kind of opening. The room wasn't that big so it didn't take long to soak up the entire layout. That demon still haunted me. The voice growing louder as the form stayed rooted where it stood. I placed my hand on the floor and lifted myself up, turned around to scan the wall behind me. Then I saw something I couldn't believe. The form was now right at my back, whispering into my mind how I shouldn't have come. I felt its breathing on the back of my neck, but I refused to turn around. A large rectangle was scratched into the wood. A small dent chipped away right at the center. Right in front of my eyes, I saw the large seven that I mindlessly etched into the wall. I knew, I knew what it was. Room seven was just beyond that wall, where room five was just moments ago. I don't know how I had done it. Maybe it was just my state of mind at the time, but I created the door. I knew I had, in my madness, I had scratched the wall that I needed most and exit to the next room. Room 7 was close, and I know that demon was right behind me, but for some reason it couldn't touch me. I closed my eyes and placed both hands on the large 7 in front of me. I pushed. I pushed as hard as I could. The demon was now screaming in my ear. It told me that I was never leaving. It told me that this was the end, but I wasn't going to die. I was going to live there in room 6. I wasn't. I pushed and screamed at the top of my lungs. I knew I was going to push through the wall eventually. 
I clenched my eyes shut and screamed. The demon was gone. I was left in silence. I turned around slowly and I was greeted by the room that was the same as one I had entered. Just a chair and a lamp. I couldn't believe it, but I didn't have time to dwell. I turned back to the seven and jumped back slightly. When I saw it was a door. It wasn't the one that I had scratched, but just a regular door with a large seven on it. My whole body was shaking. It took me a while to turn the knob. I just stood there, staring at the door. I couldn't stay in room six. There's no way. But if this was only room six, I can't imagine what room seven had in store. I must have stood there for an hour just staring at the seven. Finally, with a deep breath, I twisted the knob and opened up the door to room seven. I stumbled through the door, mentally exhausted and physically weak. The door behind me closed and I realized where I was. I was outside. Not outside like room five, but actually outside. My eyes stung. I wanted to cry. I fell to my knees and tried, but I just couldn't. I was finally out of that hell. I didn't even care about the prize I was promised. I turned and saw the door that I just went through was the entrance. I walked to my car and drove home, thinking of how nice a hot shower sounded. I pulled up to my house. I felt uneasy. The joy of leaving the no-end house had faded, and dread was slowly building up in my stomach. I shook it off as a residual effect from the house and made my way to the front door. I entered and immediately went up to my room. There on my bed was my cat, Baskerville. He was the first living thing I'd seen all night. I reached out to pet him. He hissed and swiped at my hand. I recoiled in shock, as he never acted like that. I thought, whatever, he's just an old cat. I jumped in the shower and got ready for what I was expecting to be a sleepless night. After my shower, I went to the kitchen to make something to eat. I descended down the stairs and turned into the family room. What I saw was going to be burned into my mind forever. My parents were lying on the ground, naked and covered in blood. They were mutilated to near unidentifiable states. Their limbs were removed and placed next to their bodies. Their heads were placed on their chests facing me. The most unsettling part was their expressions. They were smiling, as though they were happy to see me. I vomited and sobbed right there in the family room. I didn't know what happened. They didn't even live with me at the time. I was a mess. Then, I saw it. A door that was never there before. A door with a large eight scrawled on it in blood. I was still in the house. I was standing in my room, but I was still in room seven. The faces of my parents smiled wider as I realized this. They weren't my parents. They couldn't be. But they look exactly like them. The door marked eight was across the room, behind the mutilated bodies in front of me. I knew I had to move on, but at that moment, I gave up. The smiling faces tore into my mind. They grounded me where I stood. I vomited again and nearly collapsed. That's, that's when the hum returned. It was louder, louder than ever, and it filled the house and shook the walls. The hum compelled me to walk. I began to walk slowly, making my way closer to the door and the bodies. I could barely stand, let alone walk. And the closer I got to my parents, the closer I came to suicide. The walls were now shaking so hard it seemed as though they were going to crumble. But still, the faces smiled at me. As I inched closer, their eyes followed me. I was now between the two bodies, a few feet away from the door. The dismembered hand crawled the way across the carpet towards me. All the while, the faces continued to stare. New terror washed over me, and I walked faster. I didn't, I didn't want to hear them speak. I didn't want the voices to match that of my parents. 
They began to open their mouths, and the hands were inches away from my feet. In a dash of desperation, I lunged myself at the door, threw it open, and slammed it behind me. Room 8. I was done. After what I had just experienced, I knew there wasn't anything else this fucking house could throw at me that I couldn't live through. There was nothing short of the fires of hell that I wasn't ready for. Unfortunately, I underestimated the abilities of the No End House. And even more unfortunately, things got more disturbing, disgusting, more terrifying, and more unspeakable in room 8. I have trouble believing what I saw in the room. Again, the room was a carbon copy of 3 and 6, but sitting in the usually empty chair was a man. After a few seconds of disbelief, my mind finally accepted the fact that the man sitting in the chair was me. Not someone who looked like me, it was David Williams. I walked closer, I had to get a better look even though I was sure of it. He looked up at me and I noticed tears in his eyes. Please, please don't hurt me. What? I asked. Who are you? I'm not going to hurt you. Yes, you are. He was sobbing now. You're going to hurt me, and I don't want you to. He sat in the chair with his legs up and began rocking back and forth. It was actually pretty pathetic looking, especially since he was me, identical in every way. Listen, who are you? I was only just feet from my doppelganger. It was the weirdest experience yet, standing, talking to myself. I wasn't scared, but I would be soon. Why are you? You're going to hurt me. You're going to hurt me. If you want to leave, you're going to hurt me. Why are you saying this? Just calm down, all right? Let's figure this out and... Then I saw it. David was sitting down wearing the same clothes as me. Except for a small red patch on his shirt, embroidered with the number nine. You're gonna hurt me. You're gonna hurt me. Please don't. Please. You're gonna hurt me. My eyes didn't leave the small number on his chest. I knew exactly what it was. The first few doors were plain and simple, but after a while they got a little more ambiguous. The seven was scratched into the wall, but with my own hands. Eight was marked in blood above the bodies of my parents. But nine? This number was on a person. A living person. Worse still, it was a person that looked exactly like me. David, I had to ask. Yes, you're gonna hurt me. You're gonna hurt me. He continued to sob and rock back and forth. He answered to David. He was me, right down to the voice. But that nine... I paced around for a few minutes while he sobbed in his chair. The room had no door similarly to room 6. The door I came through was gone. For some reason, I assumed that scratching would get me nowhere this time. I studied the walls and the floor around the chair, sticking my head beneath and seeing if anything was below. Unfortunately, there was. Below the chair was a knife. Attached to it was a tag that read, to David from management. The feeling in my stomach as I read the tag was something sinister. I wanted to throw up, and the last thing I wanted to do was remove that knife from under that chair. The other David was still sobbing uncontrollably. My mind was spinning into an attic of unanswerable questions. Who put this here? How do they know my name? Not to mention the fact that as I knelt on the cold wood floor, I also sat on the chair, sobbing in protest of being hurt by myself. It was all too much to process. The house and the management had been playing with me this whole time. My thoughts, for some reason, turned to Peter, and whether or not he made it this far. If he did, if he met a Peter Terry sobbing in this very chair, rocking back and forth, I shook the thoughts from my head. They didn't matter. I took the knife from under the chair, and immediately, the other David went quiet. David, he said in my voice, what do you think you're going to do? 
I lifted myself off the ground and clutched a knife in my hand. I'm going to get out of here. David was sitting in the chair, though he was very calm now. He looked up at me with a slight grin. I couldn't tell if he was going to laugh or strangle me. Slowly, he got up from the chair and stood, facing me. It was uncanny. His height and every way he stood matched mine. I felt the rubber hilt of the knife in my hand as I gripped it tighter. I didn't know what I was planning on doing with it, but I had a feeling that I was going to need it. Now, his voice was slightly deeper than my own. I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to hurt you and I'm going to keep you here. I didn't respond. I just lunged and tackled him to the ground. I had mounted him and looked down, the knife poised and ready. He looked up at me, terrified. It was like I was looking in a mirror. Then, the hum returned. Low and distant, though I still felt it in my body. David looked up at me as I looked down at myself. The hum was getting louder, and I felt something inside me snap. With one motion, I slammed the knife into the patch on his chest and ripped down. Blackness fell on the room, and I was falling. The darkness around me was like nothing I had experienced up to this point. Room 4 was dark, but it didn't come close to this completely engulfing me. I wasn't even sure if I was falling after a while. I felt weightless, and completely covered in the dark. Then a deep sadness came over me. I felt lost, depressed, and suicidal. The sight of my parents entered my mind. I knew it wasn't real, but I had seen it, and the mind has trouble differentiating between what is real and what isn't. The sadness only deepened. I was in room 9 for what seemed like days. The final room. And that's exactly what it was. The end. The No End House had an end, and I reached it. At that moment, I gave up. I knew that I would be in that in-between state forever, accompanied by nothing but darkness. Not even the hum was there to keep me sane. I had lost all senses. I couldn't feel myself. I couldn't hear anything. Sight was completely useless here. I searched for a taste in my mouth and found nothing. I felt disembodied and completely lost. I knew where I was. This was hell. Room 9 was hell. Then it happened. A light. One of those stereotypical lights at the end of the tunnel. I felt the ground come up from below me and I was standing. After a moment or two of gathering my thoughts and senses, I slowly walked towards the light. As I approached the light, it took form. It was a vertical slit down the side of an unmarked door. I slowly walked through the door and found myself where I started in the lobby of the No End House. It was exactly how I left it, still empty and still decorated with childish Halloween decorations. After everything that happened that night, I was still very wary of where I was. After a few moments of normalcy, I looked around the place trying to find something different. On the desk was a plain white envelope with my name handwritten on it, immensely curious yet still cautious. I mustered up the courage to open the envelope. Inside was a letter, again handwritten. David Williams, congratulations, you made it to the end of the No End House. Please accept this prize as a token of your great achievement. Yours forever, management. With the letter were five $100 bills. I couldn't stop laughing. I laughed for what seemed like hours. I laughed as I walked out to my car and laughed as I drove home. I laughed as I pulled into my driveway. I laughed as I opened the front door to my house and laughed as I saw a small number 10 etched into the wood.
I want to say a special thank you to my $10 and above patrons, Paul Z, Mr. Swiston, Official Jerboa, Chaos X, JY Pyromancer, and Hayden MH. Thank you guys so much. If you want access to exclusive Patreon-only stuff, like stories and having your name read off or put in the description, head over to the Patreon. That will be linked in the description. Thanks for watching.